Sybil Luddington, the female Paul Revere. Will Papa stay home this time? Sybil Luddington smiled as she tucked the covers around the boy. Each of her seven brothers and sisters had asked the same question at least twice since Colonel Luddington had came home from war. He'll be here for a while, Sybil told her youngest brother. The men have been given only enough time to do their spring planting. Then Papa will have to go back again? Yes, the war is far from over, she replied with a sigh. Now close those eyes. I must get back downstairs, for I hear a horse coming into the mill yard. The boy listened for a moment, then said, Maybe it's General Washington. Not likely, Sybil laughed. He's probably gone home to Virginia to do his spring planting, too. Now, no more of your delaying tactics, young man. Good night. Her brother grinned in good-natured defeat. Night, Sib, he called, for he was already on her way downstairs. Before she reached the large kitchen, Sybil could hear the drum-like sound of a heavy fist on the front door. Colonel Luddington! Colonel Luddington! A voice cried urgently. The British are raiding Danbury! Sybil raced into the room just as exhausted messenger was being led to a chair by the fire. Why, Danbury's less than thirty miles to the east, she exclaimed, but neither of the two men even noticed her presence. Her grim-faced father was listening in intently as the messenger related the Danbury, Connecticut, had been left virtually unprotected. When the American troops were dismissed to take care of the spring planting, only 150 militiamen had remained behind to guard the storehouses of the Continental Army. This small force could do little to stem the onrushing tide of the enemy. Even now, General William Tryon's 2,000 troops were looting and burning the town. We must immediately recall our men from their farms, Colonel Ludington declared. Everyone must be warned, for the British may not stop at Danbury. They may decide to raid here as well. We'll have the men meet here at the mill. As soon as they arrive, I... Sybil's father stopped suddenly when he realized the spent condition of the man before him. With a worried frown, he went on. But who will summon the men? You're too exhausted to ride farther, and I will stay here to muster the men as they arrive. There's no one else who... I can, Sybil's voice rang out. I will sound the alarm. A sixteen-year-old girl? Colonel Luddington almost gasped, then began shaking his head negative, negatively. The night is dark and the road's unsafe. Quarries and, and brigands infest every byway. I know all the farms. I can do it, Sybil insisted. But, daughter, it would be many miles, many dark and dangerous miles. I cannot permit. Father, Sybil broke in, the people must be warned, and there simply is no one else to do it. Before Colonel Luddington could answer, Sybil had rushed outside to the shed where the horses were kept. Within minutes, she had slipped a bridle over her favorite horse's head. After firmly cinching the saddle, she leaped on its back. Colonel Luddington was standing outside as she rode up. There was worry, but also a touch of pride in his voice when his, he told his daughter, Remember the men are to muster here at the mill. Also tell the women to gather their valuables and be ready to move out at a moment's notice should Tryon get this far. Sybil nodded as she prodded her mount with the small stick she carried. The horse's hoofs sound like thunder on the frost-hardened ground. Soon the lights of Ludington House were swallowed up by the dark trees that arched the road behind her. Even though it was late April, the night was chill, and Sybil was shivering by the time she reached the first farmhouse. Without dismounting, she called, The British are burning Danbury! Muster at Colonel Ludington's mill! Prepare for a British raid! The startled farmer who appeared at the door did not seem to comprehend, so Sybil shouted her message again, then galloped off. She traveled south towards Carmel, crying out her warning at each farm, then on to Lake M Mahopak. There were no lights burning in the homes now, for the hour was late. Without these small and welcoming beacons, Sybil felt her courage faltering, and she fought back the tears of fear as she rode on. All too well she remembered the stories of the notorious cowboys who roamed the area. Though they professed to be helping the British, the cowboys were really only lawless murderers who plundered outlying districts for their own selfish gain. For one swift moment, Sybil felt like turning back, but the reality of the British at Danbury was much more frightening than the possibility of meeting any cowboys, and she rode on. The coldness of the April night had numbered, numbed her hands and feet by the time she reached Tompkins Corners, and the horse's breath was rasping. She knew it would be impossible to reach each and every home in the area, but the ones she did notify could warn the others. Farmer's Mills was a few minutes behind her when she felt her horse falter. He was tiring now, she realized, and well, he might, for they had already covered nearly 30 miles. Only a little while longer, she consoled the laboring animal as well as herself. 
Over and over, her cry was heard so that by the time Sybil left Pecksville on her way home, her voice was no more than a hoarse crack. But she had done it. She had warned her neighbors of the British threat. The Ludington Mill Yard was full of men when Sybil guided the weary horse through the front gate. In the flurry of preparing for the march to Danbury, there was a little more than hurried. Well done, Sybil, but in quieter days, when the British had finally been driven from the land, the story of Sybil Ludington's heroic ride would be repeated with pride, and she would be remembered forever afterwards as the, no, the female Paul Revere.